I am Laura Miller. I'm a research associate in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of sort of take you through what I would do with a sample that I bring into my lab to convert it from a, a fish in the field into some genetic data that I can then use to study aspects of fish populations. Um, a lot of my work is, is coordinated with the DNR, um, funded by the DNR, and they often are the ones providing me the samples, so I don't always have to go out and get the fish, they're bringing them to me. And in a lot of cases, the samples are based on old scale collections. They've already done the work for other purposes. They use a lot of fish scales for, for aging, uh, primarily, that's why they have them around. Brown material, that's the a, that's a skin, the coloring you'd see on a fish. That gets stuck to the scale, which is really a, a bony part. So the DNA is especially in that tissue that's stuck onto the scale. And in these tubes, I use a real simple um, DNA extraction procedure. It was developed actually for forensic work, where you have just a tiny amount of tissue with a little bit of DNA. And in here is just a uh, sterilized water along with a little resin. It's a little then we put them to boil for about eight to 10 minutes, and that boiling is gonna just sort of burst open the cells and release the DNA into the solution. So the next step in the process would be to take a bunch of these samples. They've gone through the boiling procedure. We spun them down. We use these 96 well plates that we fill up with a little portion of the DNA. And just so it's a little easier to see, each little well would have a small amount of this solution containing DNA and the next step is to add that to what we call our master mix or a cocktail of ingredients. It's sort of replicating or it's, it's mimicking DNA replication in the cell. This is a plate that's come out of the thermal cycle, so it's gone through the PCR reaction. Each well represents a fish amplified in one genetic region and I'm drawing out a little bit of the green solution in this reaction, there's a, a green color to help you see what you're doing while you're loading it, and it was put up automatically into the buffer. So I just draw out a little bit of that green material that has the amplified DNA in it, and I've got a really fine tip because these plates are only 0.8 millimeters thick, the, uh, the gel itself. What I've done over here, and I can stop this run. And by twisting it around, it's probably hard to see on video, but there's a tracking die that shows us we've got some samples running. The electricity has been pulling the DNA from up in the gel down to the bottom. So the electricity is just pulling the charged DNA downward, or that's the way I think of it because the way our gels are set up. But then the, the acrylamide, the material in the gel itself, acts sort of like a sieve. So electricity is just pulling, and the smaller the DNA fragment, the faster it can sieve its way down through the gel material. The actual gel material is sandwiched in between a couple glass plates. So I'm going to separate the two plates. And this now goes back in a stain. And we'll have to sit and wait five to 10 minutes because the DNA in the gel now is gonna pick up a chemical called lithium bromide. It sticks to DNA and then we're going to take it back another room where there's an uh, ultraviolet lamp and that will actually brighten up that dye fluoresces under UV light. And it did work well. So now, as you see, running down the gel, so there's 20 some samples that are in this gel. So running down a column is an individual fish. And then the bright bands that appear are the DNA and how far they've migrated. So the ones that have gone lower, they've migrated further through the gel. Now, I know from this that those are one species, in this case, of sculpin. Um, and that's a small fish. It's especially common in the trout streams, cold water streams. So a lot of our work has been on Southeast Minnesota, looking at these sculpin populations.